wait, wait just a minute. Before we get started, uh, I wanted to share with you a little bit because the sermon is going to go one direction, but I kind of want to fill in a little bit of a blank. Uh, you know, as many of you know, I was in Israel uh, back in February. It was during that time that I gained a whole new perspective on what Scripture says and how it's written. And in those moments, when you come back, you always remember as you read through Scripture, as you tie things together, you remember what things looked like back in Israel. Well, Paul today is going to be doing the same thing. It says in Galatians chapter 1 that when he met the Lord, when he met Christ on that Damascus road, he went and was healed then of the blindness, but then he said he didn't go to Jerusalem, but instead he went immediately into Arabia. Well, today what we're going to do is we are going to see where Paul again talks about Mount Sinai in Arabia. And I think he does that because if you remember from the first week, Galatians, one of the first letters he wrote, it was an early book. And so I think he's still thinking about Arabia, still remembering that picture of Mount Sinai. So I, it wasn't enough to really make a point in the sermon, and it really didn't go along with the rest of the sermon. But I wanted to share that with you so that when we read it later on, you'll understand where Paul's coming from. All right, enjoy the sermon. I'll see you later. God bless. Well, good morning and welcome to week number four, number four in our series in Galatians. And this week, we are going to be in Genesis chapter 12. Yes, I know, Genesis chapter 12. I uh, really need to go back and look at some things back here. There's so much to cover because really to understand all the beautiful intricacies going on in Galatians, I really want to go back and look at a story in Genesis, but uh, there's good news and some bad news in this. The bad news is that uh, we really don't have time to cover all of what Paul is unpacking here, uh, unfortunately. But the good news, the good news is that Paul in Galatians is actually talking about two covenants that we've already have dived into way back in June. I don't know if you remember our series on covenants, uh, but we talked about two specific covenants back in June. Uh, one of them was the Mosaic Covenant, and the other one was the covenant given to Abraham. Uh, so if you remember that, great. Uh, but listen, honestly, I'm really starting to be thankful for recording these sermons and putting them up on YouTube. Uh, if you either have no idea what I'm talking about, or if you don't remember, uh, you can just go to YouTube and watch both those sermons, and you'll get a better grasp of what we're going to be talking about in Galatians, uh, along with what I'm going to talk about today. So Genesis chapter 12, while you get to Genesis chapter 12, let me just say this has been an absolutely beautiful week for me. Uh, specifically, I have loved the weather. I mean, I, I understand that some people, they love the heat of the summer. Eh. Uh, some of you like the cold of the winter. You just snuggle into the blankets. But for me, for me, I love the chill of fall. I love the colors that God beautifully paints on the trees I know this may seem strange, but I love the smells that fall provides so many times. As I sit out in the woods in my tree stand, it is, it is hunting season, you know. Uh, I sit in the tree stand and I look at the beauty 
of the woods and the bright leaves changing colors almost as if right before my very eyes. And, and it is in those moments that I am reminded of the God who we love, uh, what he's really like, how generous his heart is towards us. And often for me, those moments in solitude in nature, those encounters, become such a holy moment that it removes every doubt of God's goodness and grace. And I just, I just sit back and reflect that this is the kind of God I love and the beauty that he provides for us freely, not because we deserve it, but because he loves us. And now, I also know that not all of you can relate to that kind of experience, but maybe you can think of applying what I'm talking about to where you often see God showing up in your life, where God puts his passionate love on display for you. And while you think about that, uh, let's get back to Genesis chapter 12 so that that way we can eventually get to Galatians and wrap this up this week, understanding just how loving and good our God is. So let's go ahead and start by reading a little bit about Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, and I'm going to start at verse 1 in Genesis chapter 12. And it says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so Abraham, in verse 4, it says, And Abraham left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now, we continue reading, and we learn of all kinds of family issues, of some battles, of some trials, of famine. And, and all throughout all this time, Abraham continues to wait and wait and wait for this promise that God had given him. And we realize he has got to be getting a little impatient, right? I mean, he left home at 75. And then let's jump to chapter 15. And we get to chapter 15, which is probably just a little shy of 10 years later. And we read that God shows up again in verse 1 of chapter 15 it says this after this the word of the lord came to abram in a vision do not be afraid abram i am your shield and your very great reward but abram said O sovereign lord what can you give me since i remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is eleazar the damascus and abram said you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And then the word of the Lord came to him, verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. And God took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And so here is Abram, probably in his early, close to mid-80s, still waiting for this promised child, 10 years at least, -ish about. And uh, I think we see the humanity of Abraham in this story, and, and of Sarah as well, because as they wait for this year after year as they continue to wait they struggle with this idea of God's completion in his timing you know uh, years ago I heard someone say this and I've since adopted it uh, it, 
I, and I say it probably too often, uh, that God's timing is perfect, but he misses a lot of opportunities to do it faster. Uh, you see, we may know intellectually that God's timing is perfect, but when he makes us wait, or when we feel like he's no longer paying attention, in our times of distress, or when things, when we think things should be happening, we often begin to doubt, and we begin to try to achieve his promises in our own ways. And that's really what happens here. Because when we jump to the next chapter in Genesis 16, we read how Abraham and Sarah kind of collaborate together to make things work out, right? Uh, so let me read quickly. Let's read Genesis 16, and uh, starting with verse 1, we're going to read this as well. It says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had bore him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, which means he's now 85, Sarah, his wife, took his Egyptian, her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she, be, she, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Verse 6 says, Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. And that is significant, that Sarah mistreated Hagar, and therefore Hagar fled from Sarah. Let's go on to verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near the spring in the desert. It was the spring that was beside the road to Shur, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. And the Lord, the angel of the Lord said to her, You are now with child, and you will have a son, and you will name him Ishmael. So honestly, uh, there is a lot here, but the point of today is not necessarily found here. Uh, we just need to understand this backstory so we grasp this passage that we're going to look at in Galatians. But uh but to save some time, let me, let me finish this series. Uh, let me finish this, uh, finish this story. Abram, in his old age, like he's 100 years old, finally he and Sarah have Isaac, and Isaac is born. Isaac, a child from Abraham and Sarah. It's the promised birth through which God's covenant would be completed. But this whole situation set up a tension within Abraham's household, a tension between Hagar and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac. It caused a lot of dysfunction that continued to go on within their house as we read through the next few chapters. And it all culminates in chapter 21, uh, so let's read chapter 21, verses 8 through 10, and it says this, The child, this is uh, Isaac, the child grew and was weaned, 
And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son, whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. You see, what we need to grasp here is that Hagar is still Sarah's slave, still subject to the rule of Sarah. And since she is a slave, her child is also a slave, born into slavery. But yet there is this tension because Ishmael is also still Abraham's son, yet still a slave. And I would assume that he, Ishmael, is struggling to be significant. And in this, he's picking on, or as the passage says, mocking Isaac, even at Isaac's party, a celebration held in Isaac's honor. And yet Ishmael is mocking him. So let me say it this way. Isaac, Isaac, the promised son of the true lineage of Abraham and Sarah, the joyful fruit of God's promise is being mocked and ridiculed by Ishmael. And it is with this understanding, this friction, this odd family dynamic that I want to jump back forward into Galatians chapter 4 and read what Paul wrote to the Galatians. So let's read Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 21 and read all the way to the end of the chapter. So Galatians first, chapter 4, verse 21, all the way to the end of the chapter. And it says this. Paul writes, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. These things may be taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants, one covenant from Mount Sinai, and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Verse 28, Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. You see, Paul is again taking us back and reminding us and reminding those in Galatian of their freedom that they found in Christ. He's saying the choice is yours. Freedom in Christ or slavery under the law. And Paul is pointing out here in this, in this beautiful language, he's very clear how those who try to live by the law are eager 
to ensnare those who are trying to live in the freedom of the promise. Where Paul says, listen, you need to get rid of the law. You need to choose freedom in Christ, a freedom that carries with it adoption as children of God. Born not of natural descent, nor of the human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Born of a God who loves us so much that he desires for us to know him, to see his beauty each and every day, to grow and understand who he is more and more each day, to seek to love him. Let me give you a question to ponder this week as we close. As we've gone through these four weeks and looked at the gospel of the law and the gospel of Christ, one that calls us to work harder and one that gives us freedom, I want you to ponder this question. If this God that we worship is truly a God that is loving, if he really wants us to know him, love him, abide in him. Would the way that God provides us to be with him be a way through our own work, dependent on our own goodness? Or would he provide a way by his overabundance and grace that is dependent upon his own goodness? I think the answer would give us not only hope, but it would help us define why we say the gospel of Christ is such good news. Ponder that this week. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Let's pray as we close. Almighty and gracious God, again, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful gospel of grace that you have given us through Christ through his death on the cross and resurrection, we may live in your presence with your Holy Spirit in us, guiding and directing us and drawing us closer to you so that we would never have to be a child of slavery, but a child of Christ, a child of God, free through Christ. God, continue to provide us with your grace with your grace each and every day as we share your love in the world around us for we ask these things in Jesus name amen all right again i thank you for joining us i look forward to finishing this series oh in 2 weeks we got galatians 5 next week and then 6 the week after it's all going to kind of come back together and it'll all make sense in the end. I hope you've enjoyed this time. I really have. And uh, I will say God bless and have a great week.